Good morning. Welcome to Brighter Morning with Bo. And we're glad to have you back. Our first hour is over. We had the news. We saw some clips uh, from pre-election uh, um, leader, if pre-election of the leaders of Tobago, uh, both the winners and the losers. And now we go on to Mr. Wilfred Degans and Sean Gibson, and we are going to welcome them and ask them to explain what is the organization that they represent, the SRDC. So let us talk to them this morning. Good morning, Mr. Degans. Good morning, Mr. Gibson. Yes, sir. Good morning, um, Dr. Tiwari. Thanks for having us on your widely viewed program. Thank you. A little bit about the Shuffling and Repair Development Company, also known as SRDC, is that we were established way back in 2008 under an initiative to diversify the oil and gas sector and our economy. Well, today we probably have to say that we are one of the largest maritime organizations in the Caribbean region, and we have over 120 stakeholders on board. Some, com so some of the companies are Massey, Caterpillar, we have Alston, Shipping, Sherwin Williams, FT Farfa, Qualitech, Quality Asset Integrity Maintenance Management Services. So we have really grown throughout the years, and our flagship project is the Library Shipyard Project, which we have been promoting for the last 12 years. All right. Now, you have all of these stakeholders in the shipping industry uh, that you are involved with. Um, how, what, what are the diversified set of things that these people do, these various companies do in the shipping industry. Explain that to me so that an ordinary person can understand when you say shipping industry, what that means to the ordinary person. All right, well, a lot, a lot of persons um, may not know that 90% of all what we have in our houses and our businesses are imported and this is imported on an ocean-going ship, normally from United States, as far as Asia and so forth. These ships are like automotive um, vehicles. They need to be repaired from time to time. Normally, every five years, these ships have to be dried up. So our stakeholders, for example, Sherwin-Williams, they are one of the leading um, suppliers of marine coatings besides household uh, paint. You know, they're known to supply uh, quite a bit of coatings to the United States Navy. ASCO, for example, they are actively involved in the oil and gas logistics business. And in that industry, they have to use a lot of ships, primarily what we call offshore supply vessels. And, and right now they are in Suriname. Massey Caterpillar is well known in Trinidad as an authorized distributor and sales support for Caterpillar marine engines. All ships, just like an automotive vehicle, have to be powered by an engine. So it's important that um, we have stakeholders, both local and global, that can support the shipyard project, which we propose at Lavery. All right. So these ships come and go and bring things to Trinidad and Tobago, including things that might have to do with the shipping industry. And if something goes wrong with them, or if they need to be... Um, what can I say, renewed, rehabilitated, uh, and they need to go to dry dock for a few days to get themselves ship ready, um, sea worthy and sea ready to go back. Can they do that in Trinidad and Tobago? Yes, we have um, developed the maritime ship repair industry for over 110 plus years, similar to the oil and gas sector. Um, a lot of skills that are applied in the oil and gas sector, we can um, easily adopt in the maritime ship repair sector. So, um, for example, um, we have quite a bit of ships that go to point 14 to the Atlantic LNG liquefaction terminal. Yes. So, yes, we have quite a bit of skill sets that have been developed parallel to the oil and gas sector, which can easily come across into the 
Maritime Ship Repair Arena. Where is that ship repair arena now? All right, well, we have um, shipyards concentrated in Shagaramas. However, there are big restrictions in terms of um, land space available on the Northwest Peninsula. We also have a shipyard in the heart of Port of Spain. Again, they're constricted by this available land acreage available. They have no room to expand there. So therefore we have to look in the southwestern part of our island. Okay, so all right, and that is where Labre comes in. Is that yes. correct? Now what you are yes, talking right. what you are talking about is really a private sector initiative for a growing industry to get a space uh, where ships can dock for repair. Uh, and for other services that they might need. What is the relationship between what you want and what the government is taking an initiative about with the Chinese government to create a port uh, in Labre? Uh, first of all, describe what the two are, what the differences are, and then, uh, then we will talk about it. Okay. All right. The whole idea to set up a world-class facility at Labre was the brainchild of the SRDC. We have been promoting the idea because don't forget Labre is on the western coastline of Trinidad and it, it borders the Gulf of Paria, which is one of the largest sheltered deep water harbors. So we actually approached the um, the government, starting first with the, the former government back in 2011, and we have been diligently working with the community because we, we look at having community involvement and buying as so important in this project. We have also had um, discussions with several um, environmental activists, such as Dr. Wayne Kublau saying we had a meeting with, uh, with Gary Abood from Friend of Fishermen of the and so forth. So it's important that we have buying because when the project starts, we, we do not want any problems. In terms of the Chinese um, shipyard, we are were the ones who brought the Chinese to the government, Dr. Rowley in, in particular. And uh, our project is private sector driven because we feel deep down that the ship repair industry should be privately sector driven. Because when you have these large ships, especially the LNG carriers and, and the tankers, floating production storage of loading ships that are being set up in Guyana, you have very tight timelines in terms of completion of any ship repair jobs you have. So we are of the view that private sector needs to be involved heavily in this project, and we have always promoted this idea. That's why we have a maritime cluster that has over 120 plus stakeholders, both local and global players. All right, now tell me something. The, the, well, are we, are we talking about one project or are we talking about separate projects, one involving the Chinese and the government and the other one involving SRDC? Uh, because you said you brought the Chinese to the government uh, through the prime minister to begin to engage in this issue. Is this the same project with the Chinese, the SRDC and the government, or are there two different projects, one involving the government and the government of China and the other one involving the SRDC looking for an opportunity to be a player in this shipbuilding and repair business? It's two separate projects, Dr. Tiwari. Um, the Chinese, what we have um, realized working with them initially is they need to be more transparent, right? Um, so therefore, um, we have foreign investors, both from the United States, Hong Kong, as well as European Union countries that are willing to invest. Um, in terms of the location of the two projects, they are next door to each other. The 
Chinese um, project that the Prime Minister is talking about is more on the western side of Labrie, but unfortunately that area um, is parallel to the Labrie Pitch Lake. So I don't know how they are going to construct and build a large dry docking facility with all the soft pitch that is around their site. Our site is on the eastern side of it on the Point No area. Okay, but um, tell me something. I mean, do we need two of these or do we need one or what? You tell me that the, the, the present situation is one that is split up with Shagaramas, which is not adequate. Uh, I, and I've been to that. I mean, as Minister of Planning, I've seen what you have there. I've seen the one in the port of Port of Spain, yes, and I understand what they do, but it's very limited. And the port of Spain, and we did a port study when I was Minister of Planning, in which one of the recommendations uh, would have been for a port, uh, possibly in Labre. There, there was a recommendation for a movement of the port in Port of Spain uh, towards the sea lots area expansion and a deep water harbor there as one possibility, and the other one was for a port in Labre. And certainly the dry docking facilities was one of the recommendations for the port of Labre. And it felt that complementarily you could have a major expansion of the port in Port of Spain and the existing dry docking facilities uh, in Labre. So I'm familiar with that. Um, so I want you to answer me the question, do we need two dry docking facilities? Do we need one? Can two coexist? Um, you brought the Chinese here, you are not happy with how they are operating, so you are kind of pursuing the idea that you had in 2008 and you are continuing with that now to bring the private sector players. Help me to clarify the confusion that is emerging in my mind. Sure. Um, yes, the, the Chinese, um, from what we have seen, it started with China Harbor Engineering Company. They have big problems um, right now in Guyana, for example, with their airport. They have been contracted to build a world-class airport in Georgetown, and, and that, that project is lingering for many years, going on to 10 years right now. So um, the question of whether we can um, coexist, yes, certainly. For example, Singapore is a country, an uh, island state, just like Trinidad, that has um, an area of 150 size of an island. And um, they have 87 licensed shipyards. So there's so many ships now. For example, just um, yesterday I was reading an article on Bloomberg News. The United States is going to be the largest LNG exporter in the world. The United States Department of Energy, they have done studies to determine what number of ships they would need, new ships, and it's over 100 plus LNG carriers. So there's work and for every one of us, whether it's our project or somebody else's project. Our stakeholders have years of experience and even one of the things we have been doing is um, pre-screening of potential employees for the construction and operational phase of our project. So Mr. Gibson, he is one of our employees and you know he could advise you further, you know, on 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 this, you know. All right, let's give let's give Mr. Gibson. He's been waiting patiently, and I've been asking you the questions. And he has been waiting patiently and listening. Mr. Gibson, give me your input here at this point. Um, okay, so let's let's speak on. Um, you have a specific question for me, or, or, or do you want me to just elaborate on what uh, Mr. Degans has been saying? By the way, pleasant good morning to you and your your audience. It's a pleasure speaking with you sure. once again. What I would like you to tell me, I, w I will ask you at this point, what is preventing you from going through with your development? Because you told me you have a site 
He, um, Mr. Degan, Mr. Degan said that he had a site on the eastern side. Uh, secondly, that you had a number of interested investors. He mentioned some of the countries. He mentioned that it's a growing market in Trinidad and Tobago and a growing need. He mentioned the LNG expansion of the United States as an exporter and its implications. We didn't discuss the gas situation here, but we are going to have more involvement with gas here and Atlantic LNG ultimately will get its trains going, etc. Um, so the question is, what is preventing you from developing? What is the problem? Um, okay, we, uh, to my understanding, we have uh, some permits already issued, uh, applied for, and we have some documentation. And um, I think finally what we need would be um, documentation to go along with um, the permission of the government to use some state land in, in, in this project. And uh, that may be the bottleneck for us at this time. Uh, why it has taken that long, um, you know, perhaps Mr. DeGans can answer that because uh, he's at the, the top of the food chain, uh, right. per se. Okay. I okay. am staff and I can speak about, you know, development and assessment of employees and, and, and other things. The, 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 the politics of it, um, I, I stay out of. Uh, I know heavily what we are promoting that, um, due to past projects we have seen with the Chinese model is, you know, they, they, they bring in their people, uh, they ship in their food, they fence it off so no one can see what's going on inside. And they have, they cook and, you know, they eat, sleep and work there. And uh, very little, if any, is offered to the local workforce. Um, if we're going to undertake uh, such a development, um, we believe that, you know, the idle workforce that we have here uh, and the unemployed uh, should be given first preference in working in those developments that are coming to our land. And um, for that purposes, we have been um, looking at applications, interviewing people, assessing uh, skill levels, uh, identifying where critical needs are. So we have a, a database that uh, shows what our needs are and, 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 and what skill sets we have uh, as, as regard to the, work or the local workforce here. Uh, that is something that I'm looking forward to. Uh, you know, I, when the shipyard is done, of course, it's going to bring revenue to the country. Uh, however, we want local involvement in every aspect of it. Now, expertise that is not readily available locally, we would have to source outside of the country. And that's where the various international stakeholders come in. Uh, many of them, uh, I'm proud to say, offer internships where locals, and not just locals, but young folks can be trained uh, in the skill sets that are needed that are not available. So folks can hone their skills that they already have. And uh, we are uh, undertaking the rollout of a, a, a training and certification program that is internationally acclaimed and accredited and is used in 128 countries around the world. Now that is based in the United States and credentialing for the training received locally will be coming from that source, stored in that database and um, you know, our people would be preferred higher, even for some of the largest who, construction countries in the world. Who is going to run the Chinese dockyard? Um, can you repeat that question? Who is going to run the Chinese dockyard? Uh, what I understand, well, um, it would be the Chinese primarily, because you have to understand, Dr. Tiwari, which I'm sure you do, that China is not only an exporter of manufactured goods, but the exporter of labor. Yes, they have these skills. In fact, 
Right now, they're the largest shipbuilding nation in the world. Yes. But our model is, is more geared towards local content and local participation. And as Mr. Gibson was saying, we do have one board in our maritime cluster, which is part of the SRDC. Participants that also have experience and trust in the maritime ship repair sector. Yeah, but you see, I asked you a question earlier and you told me that the two can coexist. But I mean, I get the feeling that you are opposed to the Chinese uh, being involved in this. And I suspect you mean also that they are getting preferential treatment from government as a government to government arrangement. You mustn't be afraid to talk on this program, you know. You could say what you want. <laughs> All right? As long as you do not say things that will, um, that will be untrue or uh, get you in trouble because of the way you say it uh, in legal terms. But um, the, I, I get the feeling, and you can correct me if I am wrong, that you are saying that basically the Chinese have a preferential arrangement with the government that is not in the best national interest. You are saying that they're going to bring in their own people, they're going to hire their own people, they're going to develop it the Chinese way, and when they finish, they are going to probably be going to give, be given the authority to manage it, as they have for many ports all over the world. All right? I mean, I know that for a fact. It's something I've been following. The Chinese are taking yes, over correct. ports. Yeah. Chinese are taking over ports, they're taking over airports, they are building, they are involved with Nicaragua in the building of a canal, they are very present in the Arctic, Arctic Circle uh, because of the, 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 this, the time they save in moving goods through that uh, part of North America into the rest of the populated North America. So I'm very aware of what's happening in the transportation industry and its logistical value. So you are saying you are opposed to that uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, and what you are opening is a home, what you want is a homegrown uh, ship building and repair and docking facility in Trinidad and Tobago that will be uh, maybe uh, owned by several parties, private sector, foreign and local, but will be very sensitive to the value chain issue and the local content issue. Is that what you are saying? Yes, well, we what? have to be um, aware of something called um, the Chinese debt trap. You know, just last week, uh, the main airport in Uganda was um, well, taken well, I, by the Chinese, I, you know? I have information saying that that is not true. All right. So, I, I mean, I saw that when it happened and there was some things there. So, we don't want to go there. And this is not about what you are against with the Chinese. I want to know what you want to do. That is another matter. Well, we could deal with that. Let me, let me, um, um, well, SRDC, uh, Dr. Tiwari, is not adverse to working with even the Chinese. What we are saying, we would work with all the players, like you suggested, a uh, conglomerate of locals from any part of the world, uh, locals as well as foreigners from any part of the world, foreign investors. Foreign direct investment is definitely needed on this project, and it would be good for Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. Having said that, we don't want development to come here and negatively impact the citizens of this country, yeah. the working class people, or, or even management and upper management. Uh, I think everyone should have a yeah, stake I, I, in it. I, and I we, we, want, we want a seat at the table for all. So we're not saying that we are adverse to the Chinese and we don't want to work with them. Or we're not even getting into the politics of the local government and the Chinese being in bed or partners or however you want to describe it. What we are saying I didn't is, say about anything about being in bed. Yeah. All I said was right. that they, you are saying that they seem to have a preference from the government to develop it, and there could be many reasons for that. 
Um, right. But, but the, what I want to ask you is that why can't your project get ahead and why do you want to talk to the country about your project not good getting ahead? Can't you talk to the government and the agencies of state in order to get your project ahead? What is the problem? Well, yes, we, we, we have, have um, been in dialogue. Yeah. We have been in dialogue with the um, Office of the Prime Minister. Dr. Rowley did make a promise to us to um, give us what we call a letter of comfort that will allow the various state agencies to enter upon the lands we have identified suitable at Labry. So this is an outstanding issue since um, mid-2017 and despite our many attempts in terms of written um, correspondence, we, we seem that, um, you know, to have been reaching a, a, a limit in terms of accessing this comfort letter, you know, which was promised us by the Prime Minister. Well, it seems to me that Once we have this in hand, it, definitely the project will move ahead. Our investors and stakeholders are anxiously awaiting this. Yeah, but it seems to me that you have a bigger problem, which is that you don't... I don't think you have legal access to the land. Is any business going on there and the letter of comfort will allow government agencies to inspect the land, etc. But do you have any business going on there? And do you have ownership of the land or do you have legal title? Or are you allowed to operate now? Are you operating there now? The, the letter of comfort will allow, as I said, the various state agencies no, but answer to come my on question board in terms now. of are carrying out the environmental impact assessment, no, but are you which doing is part of the overall project. Are you doing any work? There's no work going on, on on the site right now. Yeah, but I mean... Because it's state lands, and in order to um, be upon these lands, we have to get the, the written letter of comfort from the government. To allow the same state agencies to carry out the due diligence in terms of environmental surveys, etc. And who has approved the project then? Well, we have already in hand um, correspondence um, from the EMA, as I said, town and country planning. We have sat with them already. We even had presentations with the director of lands and surveys. We had two presentations, in fact, and yes, we have correspondence inside, and we patiently are waiting. The, the, the key back is the, the letter of comfort which we have been asking for what and I, promise. What I, what I want to say is that you have a good idea uh, that might be workable, but you, don't, you have not really built the platform for making it work yet. I would suggest to you that you go to the various government agencies and get this matter settled because unless you can have a relationship with the government who owns the la land, I don't see how the project has a chance of getting off the ground. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, the pandemic hasn't helped. As you know, um, we all have to remain safe and observe the various COVID-19 protocols. So I think somebody did the delay came upon because of that, you know? Well, but nevertheless, true, but, we continue to press on. But the government is talking about digitalization and e-government, etc. You all should be able to do that. Town and country planning says that it is online. I don't know if that is true. Um, you know, so, but you have to get those basics done first. What you can do, let me know what is happening. And uh, sometime later on, I will see how you progress and how this project is progressing. Meanwhile, I will take an interest in where the Chinese are with their project and see if we are ever going to get a shipbuilding industry in Trinidad and Tobago in Labrie. Thank you very much for coming on the program. This is Brighter Morning with Bo. We are signing off now for the 8 o'clock news with Andrew Tran. Thank you for watching. Tomorrow we will have Dr. Hamid Ghani to give us a broader perspective on the Tobago elections and its implications for Trinidad and Tobago and some of the constitutional issues that arise. So we see you tomorrow.